Amazing. Okay, well, that was three really extraordinary uh, presentations with a lot to think about. Um, rather than uh, too much preamble, I'd like to sort of dive right into these themes and see if we can start to make some connections between um, these different speakers. Um, you know, I was thinking uh, when Mary Pierre, when you were speaking and SJ and Robert during your uh, present, I was thinking about one of the first jobs I had when I moved to Montreal. I found it on Craigslist back when people found jobs on Craigslist. And uh, the job title was for social media manager. And so I, I get hired at this job, which is paying an extraordinary $15 an hour at the time. It's in this kind of strange, sparse, empty office. The pitches, and this is at the, the very, very early days of Twitter before pretty much anyone knew what Twitter was. And the idea was we were supposed to be building um, Twitter accounts for financial companies so that they could connect with consumers. And so the idea was we'd build up these dummy accounts with tons of followers and then they'd get handed off to clients. Took me a couple weeks, you know, with my 19 year old, not quite developed prefrontal cortex. Uh, but eventually I realized that what was actually going on was these accounts were being used to promote penny stocks once we lost control over them. And it was essentially like a very rudimentary pump and dump scheme. As far as I could figure, I quit after that. Now I'm a member of the bar, um, <laughs> you know? So, you know, but shady is all get out. And this, this would have been 2008, 2009, 2010. So early days. Um, and so I guess what I'm trying to say is that these practices are really about as old as the platforms themselves. And I think as you recognize, uh, you know, information, influence campaigns, disinformation, misinformation, propaganda, these are not new things either. But looking at how the practice has evolved, it seems to me that as things get, you know, as actors become more sophisticated, there's a research methodology problem in the sense that you only catch the people who are really bad at it. And there's also a sort of constitutional or a political problem in the sense that the better they get at it, the more the behavior starts to look like real human speech, legitimate political engagement, right? And there's a cohort, including many politicians and some scholars that are, are starting to call on platforms to take down or restrict this kind of activity. And I'm really wondering from all of your different vantage points, what you make of those uh, legal and political demands. Uh, how, you know, is it the state's role to control this kind of speech? If, if so, through what frameworks ought we, think, ought we to think about that? Um, you know, how much of this is a real freedom of expression problem? How much of this is a market problem? Uh, how much is something in between? Maybe, um, I don't know if SJ or Roger, you want to speak first to that point and we'll circle right through. Well, we're talking about behavior, looking at real human speech and the human engagement. But um, one of the things about disinformation is it's a structural problem. It's um, the falsehood is often in the structure in things like amplifications. And the detection on that is different to, is this true, false, should we throw this away? So I, I talk sometimes about, I don't want to restrict free, free speech, but I do want to restrict artificial microphones. So how do we ensure that what you have is caused, um, people dumping on top of you? And the catching people who are back, I mean, one of the nice things about this information is they have to advertise. <laughs> you know what they care about. You know what they're trying to do. You can you can see their activity. Uh, and also a lot of the focus for a long time was on this thing has become visible widely to every, the public. Now we do something about it. What we focus on is the left of boom, that earlier, earlier stage the planning and the setup stages. Can we stop this at those levels? Can we stop even before campaigns start by addressing the people who are doing this and why? So it's the reason we moved to risk uh, as the thing that we were monitoring and thing we were, we were, were looking at. Uh, truth is hard. Behavior is difficult. Um, but looking at how bad, how much, how far seems to be a sensible way to go. I'll stop talking now because there, there are many, many other things I want to hear from everybody else. That's that's a really great starting point. Uh, Marika, do you have thoughts on that? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, you're better. Okay. 
Um, yes, well, it's a really good uh, answer, SD. Uh, I don't know what to add more. What I could say is that I think that a big problem with disinformation is that, yes, sometimes for people, it's hard to find good truth information online. So the first thing that they see or they saw is uh, false information. So they believe it's true. They have uh, some false information out there, have so many likes, retweets, so people think it's true because, you know, it's popular. So it, I guess it's true. I think that's something that we, uh, you know, I read so many uh, good scientific literature out there, but often they are private. So people can't go and have those information. So I think this is also a problem more sort of like kind of social problem that we should really tackle more also because yes we could focus on uh dealing all the disinformation online but people need to find information also so uh, yeah that would be my answer yeah those are really interesting thoughts i mean i you know one of the and i, I have the, i have a hard time not thinking about this through a sort of co constitutional perspective right and that's that's the paradigm that uh, that I work through these issues and but you know part of it is you know the first amendment as the Canadian charter protects falsehoods as well as truths protects foreign speech as well as domestic speech doesn't make distinctions um, between that that type of content and so anyway I, I'm interested uh, Corey what your thoughts are on this because I think some of this circles back to uh, you know the heart of your argument which is that maybe there's a market uh, there's there's a, a question of incentives. There's a problem here. So maybe we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, this is a subject that's, of course, really difficult. Uh, and as someone who generally favors free expression, but is also very alive to the way that there are hecklers vetoes and, and that um, marginal voices can be squeezed out of a free expression environment by harassment and other free expression activities, that, that actually end up reducing the amount of discourse. These are really significant questions. So one of the first things that I think we should have clarity on, and you, you fainted at it there, I think a little Lex, with um, when you talked about uh, uh, constitutional and charter rights to be wrong, <laughs> is that uh, we, we need to be clear about um, what our goal is uh, when it comes to odious but lawful speech. Do we want to engineer a situation in which views that are lawful but odious are unutterable, not just uh, in the public square where you might, if you stood up in a restaurant and started screaming racist epithets, they might sling you at the door, but just no one ever says them. I would love to live in a world in which no one ever uttered an, a racial epithet, but I also don't wanna live in a world in which the way that we accomplish that is by setting rules about what people can say in private contexts among themselves. So this gives rise to this question about the speech platform or the speech policies of, of the big platforms. Leaving aside just for a moment, the impossibility of having a good speech policy that covers 2.6 billion people speaking hundreds of languages all across the world with lots of different contexts and you know when it's okay to swear and when it's not or to have a sexualized discourse or not or to use uh, terms that are slurs but use them within an in-group against whom the slurs are normally directed. So black people using the n-word or gay people using the word queer all of those things are so contextual and difficult and i'm just going to park them off to one side and just say that we have a story that um these are private spaces and so they get to set their own rules and when a private space sets its rules it's not censorship it's just editorializing that uh it, it, you know what what the government tells you you're allowed to say is censorship but what the restaurateur says you're allowed to say is not. But if you can imagine an experiment in which one restaurant called the No Politics at the Dinner Table restaurant gets a license to operate and then taps vast capital markets and acquires all of the other restaurants and no government intercedes to stop them from doing so. And then they get all these predatory advantages, like they can strike most favored nation deals with all the farmers so no one else can get their food. And if you try to open a restaurant down the street from them, they underprice all of your uh, items and they hire your chefs away at double the wage. You could end up in a situation where no one's allowed to talk about politics at the dinner table and in which there would be no constitutional look-in and in which you might make the argument that this is more like the rule in which the, the de facto rule we have, where if you stand up and start screaming racial epithets, any restaurateur would throw you out because it's just socially beyond the pale, as opposed to kind of the artificial rule 
constructed by one billionaire who owns this vast chain of restaurants. And so I don't think it solves our problem of people holding odious or wrong views if we shatter the, the speech monopolists, Facebook and Twitter and other major platforms for discourse. It might even make new problems. But what it does do is it makes us confront this question of uh, w what we actually want to happen about odious speech. And if it turns out that every platform in a big diverse marketplace where there's lots of places to speak and lots of web hosts and lots of DNS providers and lots of every other layer of the stack, they all have the same policy and no one makes them do it in law. Then maybe it is like the rule that just says like, I'm sorry, if you're going to fart like that, you can't be in my restaurant. And not like the rule like here in Zuckerberg's empire, there's just some things we don't talk about. And if you don't like it, find somewhere else, except I bought them all. And, and so that, that's, I think, the, 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 the place where this conversation can at least not be mired in these dumb questions about, like, is it or isn't it censorship? And instead start to work towards what is a speech policy that uh, shelters uh, marginalized voices from the heckler's veto? And what is a speech policy that moves questions of what is and isn't lawful speech out of the hands of an autocrat who's accountable to no one but their shareholders, and in some cases, not even them, because of the special structure of the shareholdings in Facebook and, and Google, where the founders own not the majority of shares, but the majority of voting shares, um, and instead moves it into the demos where we have an accountable way of deliberating. Yeah, super thoughtful. I think that that's, that's a really helpful way to think about it. I think, uh, you know, in Canada, we have... Uh, a gang of legislators who are, I think, I think it's fair to say, shockingly and dangerously uninformed on very basic questions of technology policy most of the time. And we need to look perhaps no further than the current debate going on on Bill C-10. Uh, at the same time, I think there's an emerging consensus that leaving these companies uh, to self um, and there's two essential narratives about the appropriate role of the state, of the appropriate role of uh, governments in responding, right? There's there's one school of thought, the Cory Doctorow or the Elizabeth Warren school of thought, maybe. Okay, not really, not quite. It's, it's, it's a regulation problem, I know. <laughs> but it's a market pro regulation problem. It's something that we look at through the lens of uh, antitrust, consumer protection, privacy, uh, human rights law. And then there's a sort of another approach um, that looks looks more like a remedial approach targeting the harm. So focused on creating laws that force platforms to move certain kinds of content, uh, to deplatform certain speakers, to limit the spread of certain kinds of harmful information, whether that's uh, you know um, extremist speech or hate speech or politically problematic speech or uh, harassment, misinformation, disinformation. So we have these kinds of two, these two uh, points of entry into this conversation about regulation. And I'm wondering how uh, these approaches play out in the way you think about these, these problems, about the problems of how we organize uh, our relationships online. You know, I was thinking a little bit about, for example, uh, I think I wasn't sure, maybe it was SJ, maybe it was Roger talking, but sort of like active measures to counter disinformation. How do you, anyway, what are your thoughts on these different, and maybe they're not two completely distinct schools, but what are your thoughts on how to tackle uh, these big problems? What's the role of the state in all of this? Um, I don't know if one of you wants to, I, I could just choose you like my students at random. Um, maybe Roger, we haven't heard from you yet. Can I put you in the hot seat? Uh, yeah, sure. So a couple thoughts on that. Um, at least a, a thought on the entry point. And I, I won't speak too much about markets because that's, that's not really my job, but, but I will. I can riff on the technology, and I think something that really needs to be considered here is not just like how do we want to structure our own laws and what should our responsibility be with these narratives and, and these ideas and what do we want to allow, but, but also consideration of how do we prevent our platforms by being weaponized from people who are, who are going to make it their mission to abuse these things. It's, it's not enough that we're just, it's not enough that we just decide to allow free speech uh, or we, you know, break up Facebook or, or whatever the case is. But whatever the alternative is, it still has to be something that can't be abused. And if it can be, 
just as easily. Uh, and we kind of lost that. Um, so I'm not sure that answers your question, but, but it's not occurred to me. So. Do you, do you have thoughts? Oh, I have many thoughts. <laughs> so, I mean, you're, you're focusing on the platforms and the government, and there are many, many, many actors in these spaces, because it isn't just one space. You've got the community space, you've got um, the platform, not the platform space, but the whole internet space. You, you have so many people who can respond. And it seems strange to me just to listen to, hey, what can the government do? It's like, we're all part of this. We can all help solve this. Um, it's like sort of having a word with your um, uncle at the, um, the dinner table. <laughs> it's like, let's work together, which is why we push so much on how you can work with groups, how you can work with different types of responses. And the other part is people talking about harms. Now, harms frameworks are really useful and we use them and we look at all the different types of harm, uh, you know, physical onwards, but risk is different from harm. You need to think about how far this is going, what the likelihoods are, uh, what the targets are. So, so who is vulnerable to what? What is vulnerable to what? Um, your vulnerabilities are you know, to communities, to businesses, to to governments, to countries, and they have different needs. So the things that a government may do to protect itself and its country may be different to the things the platform will do to protect itself. And quite often you need to build regulation to force the platforms. Uh, I am tired of the number of friends who are different being who've been deplatformed. Mm. And, and because that's just the way the regs work. You know, you, you trip over them. So I think the government and the platform angles are interesting, but there is more beyond. I mean, if we're talking platforms, let, let's make it hard to micro target. If we have strong privacy, privacy regulations, you, you, you lose the ability to target down to demographic level with things like political advertising, um, with things like, wait, well, you can still target down, you can still use like group types, but put that friction in the system. Sorry, I, I get a little bit excitable about um, responses because we've spent a couple of years working on this. <laughs> oh, of course, of course. And I, th I think that's really, uh, you know, a, an, a really useful synthesis of um, what Corey is saying um, and what you're saying around this issue of disinformation and, and misinformation. And, you know, this, this question of marketing, it, it, it's really the whole business model, right? Uh, improving uh, privacy protections means that the ability to target individuals based, you know, for example, on protected grounds based on, on really unique idiosyncratic things about their lives, things that, that pull on our, our hearts and our minds, you know, those, those tools of persuasion become less powerful, right? And we, you know, we all benefit for lots of different reasons uh, when there are stronger privacy protections in place. So I think that's, that's part of the reflection too. Uh, Marika, do you have something to add? Yes, exactly. Just like I said in my talk, there's kind of a problem between the fact that all those disinformation problems, fake news problems, and etc., are on social media platforms, and the solutions are also on these social media platforms. I think uh, it's a lot to put on like some people. Uh, well, there are many people working at those uh, social media platforms, but yeah, I think it, it should be spread out uh, bigger than that because just like as you said. It's, it's a social problem. There are multiple uh, people uh, concerned by that. And um, I don't have the perfect answer to this one, but yes, I think we should go and spread it uh, way more wider than this uh, to really find a good solution. Yeah. Super helpful. Um, maybe we can just build on this a little bit. We have a lot of questions um, about Gab and Parler, or, or 
it sounds so weird to say that as somebody who also speaks French parlor, uh, which, you know, and these, these uh, entities have a really interesting relationship with, with the idea that uh, Corey was proposing earlier, the, the idea that a lot of the problems on these platforms can be solved through more competitive markets. And there's also a really close connection with this idea of self-determination and the idea of protected spaces for kind of core individual political expression online. And yet, these are also unambiguously awful places on the internet. Um, so how do, how do each of you see these platforms, uh, or these entities uh, from your respective vantage points? Are they a counterbalance against the idea of echo chambers? Do they create them? What kinds of threats and risks are, are they the source of? What do, how, do they, how, how do you fit these emerging entities? Or are they even emerging? You know, like I, I'm a little bit more of the internet era of 4chan, right? And so there's not, you know, how different, anyway, maybe Corey, you can start. How do you think about these yeah. places online? I, I think SJ really put uh, her finger on something very important when she talked about friends who've been deplatformed, because the, the notion of deplatforming has been mostly hijacked by elements of the far right and, and xenophobic movements. Mm -hmm. But deplatforming as a concern dates back to the deplatforming of indigenous activists, trans activists, sex workers, and sex worker advocates, Black Lives Matter advocates. Uh, you know, you, you can see it being weaponized at the state level, for example, with what's happening in Cambodia, where the dictator requires everyone to adhere to Facebook's real names policy so that he can round them up and, and torture them if they speak out against him. And if they won't, then he has Facebook deplatform them for violating their, their real names policy. And, you know, the concern about um, Gavin Parler is not who will speak for the Nazis. <laughs> the concern is that um, we have, we are creating weapons that can be wielded by people who we don't trust as much as the people who've got their hands on them today. It's very similar to the concern that you uh, alluded to, Lex, with um, C10, where there, you know, there are a lot of people in my Twitter mentions who are stalwarts of Justin Trudeau, perhaps forgetting that his political legacy includes a father who declared martial law and raided dissident groups' offices, stole their membership lists and blackmailed them. But uh, people who are fans of, of Justin Trudeau don't think that the CRTC will do anything that uh, is bad, trust in the rule of man and not the rule of law, and seem completely blind to the possibility that Prime Minister Doug Ford or Prime Minister Faith Goldie might not use these powers in ways that, that uh, they are happy to have. I, I think that it is possible to make good technology rules, notwithstanding that we have seen such bad ones emerge. Uh, and and you can see that governments can make rules on highly technical questions that they are not themselves briefed on in terms of the, the actual parliamentarians when they're motivated to do so, when it's important, and when the stakeholders have political juice. No one in parliament's a microbiologist, to my knowledge, and yet white Canadians who live in cities have potable water, leaving aside boil water advisories in indigenous communities across the country, right? People who have political juice can get the government to find out what the science says and then do it as policy. And so, you know, I, I, I think that it, it behooves us to ask, what is it that acts as the countervailing force that stops people, even those with political juice, from getting good policy? And I think it's monopoly. I think that when your industry fits around one table, and when everyone used to work with each other at one of the other five companies that make up your sector and you're all friends and you're like godparents to each other's kids and you're executors of each other's wills, you don't even have to ever explicitly arrive at a, at a, at a conspiracy, you know, although it's easier, right? We see, we see that like Facebook and Google con colluded illegally to fix ad rates that came out in the, the Texas uh, antitrust case, but you know, they wouldn't have to because you have a senior executive from Google who's now the chief operating officer of Facebook who knows what Google's plans are. She just has to say, this is the agenda of the industry and she's in a position to make it happen. And when there's a duopoly, it just happens. And so I think that if we wanna have good policy, like we can, we can ask the question, what would that good policy be? But I think we also have to ask the question, what structurally creates the space for good policy? And that is to weaken the power of industry so that it is subject to governance. Interesting. Yeah, I think that's that's a really that's a really helpful framework for thinking about this. Um, 
Marie Pierre, uh, Roger, SJ, do you have thoughts on this? Uh, on thoughts also going back to this point on Gab and Parlor and what we make of these these kinds of spaces online, how they affect your work. Anyone? Or shall I take it? Um, so I've been in Parlay since it started um, and was crawling around the data sets that we, we have. And initially it was a set of influences. You had epoch times all the way through it. But as it grew a bit, I, I started seeing K-pop stands. So um, the K-pops who, who flooded out hashtags and bought tickets and stuff. Uh, and I, I started seeing rainbows where the gay people had come in and put in information too. So I, again, anyone can be part of the, it's an information space. Mm -hmm. If you think of everyone having, having access to information space, then you have the ability to move in those spaces. And en masse, you have the ability to do interesting things in those spaces. So I don't see them as necessarily dangerous things mm -hmm. any more than meeting in somebody's front room is a dangerous thing. I, I find the injection of narratives um, for state purposes mm -hmm. a dangerous thing. But again, this is about understanding and gardening your space. And I really did enjoy all the K-pop. <laughs> The, the real name deplatforming, I, I, for a while, we, we've been thinking about things like how do you do third party verification? I um, mean, we have people in our groups who are only known by their handles. Everyone knows the Grug, everyone trusts the Grug, nobody knows who he is. Doesn't matter because he has an identity tied to his handles. So there have to be better ways of doing that. Um, the weapon part, I, I, I mean, the last couple of years in the US, SMS broadcasts were big. Even if you take away the platform, you're, you're, you're not taking away the ability to mass communicate or mass broadcast, but you are taking away the ability to individually pull people in and perhaps the imaging part, which has some value. That's, that's a random thoughts, but I'm gonna pass over to someone who's slightly more together on this. Marita, you on the floor? Uh, yes, um, I'm not, I don't really have like a fixed opinion about this. I used to think that they were sort of echo chambers, like social media platforms, that they were like more close minded people about certain stuff. But as listening to your both answers, uh, Corey and SG, I'm like a little bit more nuanced. I don't know many much about them. They're, they're mostly closed now. Um, but yeah, so uh, I'm really nuanced about those ones, I do think it's important to look at them and I'm kind of uh, interesting at seeing how it will go on the like next years or so. I really don't know how this is, it is, is it going to be more popular? I think so, but also they do have some problem just being hosted. The, the, uh, so yeah, good question. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing, uh, you know, uh, one of the comments you made, SJ, was like, look, this is not just about states. It's not just about, um, you know, it's not just the relationship between states and individuals. Really, the private sector has to think about these issues in, in really extraordinarily complex ways. We have a question also, uh, you know, asking about the implications for the not-for-profit sector. How should um, these entities think about the kind of work you do, about the, the kinds of risks you study. Uh, what, what are your, I mean, we can think about, you know, the kind of like silly, yeah. we can think about like Wayfair and QAnon, um, you know, but like what, what, what does it look like when you're a, a business or a nonprofit and you um, find yourself part of one of these stories? I actually, I've been working with um, large nonprofits for most of this year, so it's, it's my daily, daily thing, but um, businesses, there, there are different ways they're likely to be affected. Um, there, there might be direct disinformation at a business. Um, there are lots of reasons you want to do that. Sort of dumping their shares is one, one thing. No, dumping their share price. Um, you might want to manipulate the business by um, disinformation on their principles. So board members, et cetera. But that, there hasn't been that much of it. There's a, you know, a little bit of a fisty cuffs over in a couple of telecoms companies um, fighting it out. 
um, most business, it's going to be a side effect on them. So, for example, British Telecom in the UK, um, because of the COVID 5G rumors, their engineers started being attacked. Um, people were setting light to um, cell phone towers as part of their res no, disinformation response. So, this is why I say have a plan, because even though you're unlikely to be a direct target yet, and we, we think that the point at which the risks to the principles, to the people who are doing it, plus the gains that come from it um, are equivalent to starting to overtake ransomware. So that might be that ransomware is reduced enough, or there may be hybrid ransomware stroke disinformation campaigns that will probably see much more industry around this. At, at the moment, industry tends to be people doing uh, influence operations on behalf of another entity. So the EBLA, um, couple of other smaller groups, uh, which used to be marketing agencies, just do it with falsehoods. So most of this is thinking about how you might get caught up in the stream of it and thinking about if that happens, how, who are you going to call? Who are you going to work with? Who actually does this? You can go ask for help. And before that happens, just doing some of that red teaming, planning, simulation, so that your team knows the things it's got to worry about before it's actually in the thick of it. So yeah, uh, that, that's, that's just thinking around some of the things you need to do. I mean, practically, absolutely practically pre-bunking wins at the moment. So messaging based, um, especially if you're like nonprofits, getting ahead of those narratives, getting information out into space, getting trusted information in trusted space and, and going where the people are. So just already being ahead of your branding, your image mm. is helpful before you even get to it. Um, I'm gonna leave space for the next person. I think Corey may have some thoughts on this. Well, I was gonna say, you know, I, I grew up with enough crunchy granola people that I've heard a lot of these conspiracies for a long time. And one thing that's very striking about conspiracies, say about vaccines, is that the arguments haven't changed materially, right? The things that people mm -hmm. say about vaccines are about the same. And so if a, if a view becomes more widespread, but the, but the rhetoric of that view hasn't changed, then something else has changed. And um, there are those who say, well, the thing that changed is that big tech figured out how to bypass our critical faculties with machine learning. And, you know, the, the, the biggest proponents of that view are big tech. Uh, the, only they say it not as by way of apology, but instead of in their sales literature, buy our ads and we'll convince people to buy your fidget spinners. But um, the the uh, other possibility and, and something that's well documented within conspiracism literature and conspiratorial studies of conspir conspiracies and cons conspiratorialists is that people's material conditions make them vulnerable to conspiratorial accounts of events. That if people like live through a conspiracy, right? If you, if you have lived through a, an instance in which you were lied to by powerful people in a way that materially harmed you, then the next time someone says, the reason you've been harmed is that powerful people have conspired to harm you, it, that explanation has power. It, it has plausibility. And, you know, Another word for conspiracy is corruption. When, when people get together and make a deal, uh, abuse their power and authority and their trust to harm other people and benefit themselves, we can call that a conspiracy, we can call it corruption. And one of the handmaidens of corruption is monopoly. That, you know, when, when you ask an anti-vaxxer today why they don't believe in vaccines, it's rare that you'll get a lazy answer. What you'll often get is a, an incredibly energetically wrong answer an answer that is chapter and verse on a bunch of things that are 100% true about the pharmaceutical industry, like it is highly concentrated, like it's uh, major named families have done things to suborn their regulators, for example, by, by, by putting up misinformation about whether opioids were harmful.
useful or could be safely prescribed over long times, that these had real material consequences. That Apotech once told a researcher at Sick Kids Hospital that if she warned her subjects in, an, in, a, in a drug trial that members of her co of their cohort were becoming gravely ill, that they would pull funding to, to Sick Kids for future research. Uh, you know, like all of those things are true. And so if you say to me, why do you trust vaccines? And I say, well, I trust the science and I trust the regulator. I have to say, although I trust vaccines, neither of those things are true of me. I don't trust the science or the regulator in the sense that like, I know that Elsevier spent years publishing uh, lookalike journals that weren't peer reviewed and that pharmaceutical companies could publish marketing claims in that were indistinguishable from their peer reviewed journals. And I don't have the statistical background to uh, understand Understand whether the trials have real explanatory power. I'm not privy to what's going on in the halls of power. I don't know if the regulators are or aren't captured. And so from moment to moment, there's this kind of epistemological chaos and terror where questions that we can never adjudicate for ourselves, should you get in the 737 max? Is your kid being turned into a dunce by distance education? Should you trust a vaccine or will you get a blood clot? All of those questions are questions that like, even if you can answer one of them, you do not have enough time in your life to get enough PhDs to answer all of them. And where the mechanism by which we normally resolve them, which is by hoping that we have neutral adjudicators who hear expert evidence and come to a, a conclusion that reflects that best evidence, that's not there. We're in chaos. So what can a nonprofit do? Well, nonprofits can agitate against corruption. They can agitate for fairness and they can agitate for transparency and for good governance because that is the foundation on which we believe we build resistance to uh, 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 conspiratorial accounts, because when you have good governance, conspiracy is harder to pull off. Roger, do you have thoughts on that by any chance? Um, no, I'm, I'm gonna leave it there. I think that was perfect, actually. Oh, I don't, don't mean to put you on the spot there. Um, okay, I'm, I'm taking a look at the time and I maybe we'll just like to kind of end with one last big question. Um, and I think it's people in the audience at a conference like NorthSec are in a really interesting position because they're people with extraordinary technical skill and talent. Um, they're also people who, uh, you know, uh, maybe have the have the, the the talent to sort of change some of these things, or to you know, or they're people who are working for a the warlords and the bandits, so to speak. Uh, they they are the the architects but also the plumbers of surveillance capitalism, you know? So what, uh, and maybe we can uh, kind of go through for each of you, maybe we'll start with Mary Pierre. Uh, what do you think are the responsibilities of an ethical technologist in this current environment? And what do you think are the most important technical problems that you should be working on solving? And it could be related to your research and your talk today. It could be a more general reflection. Uh, what does it mean to be ethical? What is the important work to be done? Um, Mary Pierre? Yes, uh, that's a really good question. Um, I haven't put so many thoughts on that. That's not my uh, <laughs> my uh, my specialty. But I think that obviously for me, I really research about political interference um, and disinformation with social bots. Um, I think obviously if... In my case, obviously, it was getting more and more harder through the years to research those, those kind of social bots online because of the privacy and everything. And for really good reasons, the privacy is getting way harder uh, to help, help researchers to get their information. Uh, but also, this is very um, hard to, uh, it's getting way harder to do so. And I think that for the practitioners, obviously, we kind of need to help each other in some sort of way so we can really uh, provide information because I don't think for good reasons, it's going to be get way harder to research those kind of things, to prevent those kind of things uh, for privacy reasons. But obviously, there are also on the other side, we do need to prevent those disinformation, those uh, political interference online. Uh, so this is a quite a difficult question for me to uh, answer. Yeah. Oh, you're on mute. I did that thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, I feel like you took a great stab at it. Um, uh, Roger, do you have thoughts on this question? Sure, yeah. Um, 
So I think like Corey mentioned mentioned it about you know not having enough time in your life to acquire all the PhDs you need to really understand these issues. And that's and that's like pretty bad one. Um, so for us in tech, you know, when we're building systems, I think we need to give more thought to how can we build systems that enable people to trust the right things and how can we make the the, the information that people need available, you know, in a way that benefits society and benefits the individual. You know, it's, it's easy to build a recommendation engine, you know, that gets your like racist uncle to go dive into QA, you know, the world's a shittier place for it. You know, that's that's simple, right? But how do we like, you know, how do we build that same ecosystem where people are serviced better and not drawn into, you know, these harmful, these harmful relationships or harmful material? I guess maybe that even circles back to the, the original question about like censorship or what do we want to allow online? You know, if we can build systems like that that are kind of more like equitable, we can you know somewhat maybe to disperse those harms. You know, maybe they don't go away, but they're not amplified and they're not we're, we're not connecting all of you know the, the diaspora of awful people. You know, so uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. But yeah, that's that's it. Always, but not so good at actually finding the mute button. So for me, it's look at the whole system. I mean, Pablo who works with us has a saying that it's a thousand bullet solution to a thousand bullet problem. Um, there are many different moving parts in this that you can work on. Um, simple moves. Uh, it's like fixing this before the disinformation hits the platforms, doing things like I, I have a load of old accounts just lying around that might be zombies. I mean, all of us do. It's just the way the internet's grown up. So think about how you clean the systems back to where you have communities within them. Um, think, you know, just reducing those amplifications, putting in friction, putting delays in things, um, making things age out. Just as a system, slowing it a little. Um, I played with this slow internet for a while. It was like basically we did Twitter and a typewriter. But mm -hmm. if you slow people down a little, they're just generally nicer because they have to think about what they're doing. Um, diversity. I mean, system as people process, technology, culture, um, having a diversity of people. Um, always, always one of the best solutions for many tech problems is having diverse teams. So you have all these different angles and what's going on rather than just, um, I don't want to say tech bros because we're not all tech bros, but it's also within your teams and listening to the people who are most affected by things like disinformation attacks. So black women specifically have been a, a subject of disinformation for longer than most people online. And they have opinions, they have voices. A lot of them have been themselves bounced off the systems just because other people have manipulated systems around them. But the last thought really is that the people in platforms, a lot of them know what the solutions could be. They know things they could do to fix some of the issues. They want to do them, but they don't have the top cover to do them. So that's that interaction between platforms and government again. It's, it's having regulation that gives the top cover for the people who have seen things like the, these friction moves and want to do them, but they're competing against um, the things like shareholder driven business goals. So just make sure that this health of the whole system is actually up at the table with the amount of money it's making. I'm done. Next. Corey, I think you have the last word here. Sure. So, I, I mean, I think that um, the, 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 the kind of expert that I want to speak to are people who are working in, in hacking policy more than hacking code, although I think some of us do both. Uh, and, you know, hacking policy requires political will. It requires that we, we build big, broad-based movements to hold people to account, change the way that pol politicians think about what they can and can't do uh, and, and what they can and can't get away with, the Overton window. And in this, I am really informed by the copyright scholar, James Boyle, who's at the Duke University. And Jamie, he talks about the history of the term ecology. And he says that before ecology was coined, 
we had a bunch of different issues, but not a movement. And if you cared about owls and I cared about the ozone layer, like how is it that we would be on the same side, right? You're, you're fighting for like charismatic nocturnal birds. And I'm worried about the gaseous composition of the upper atmosphere. Those are not obviously the same issue, right? But the term ecology took a thousand issues and made them into one movement. It took a thousand constituencies and made sure that they all had each other's backs. It changed the political calculus, changed the way that we talk about this stuff. And I think we could be on the verge of that for Monopoly. Is there a bunch of people who are pissed off that all their beer comes from two companies or all their spirits come from two companies or that there's only three record labels or four movie studios or one theatrical exhibitor or four giant accounting firms who are uh, implicated in every single horrific corporate collapse that brings down huge swaths of the economy? You know, if anyone from Ontario was listening here remembers the Carillion collapse, all four of the big four accounting firms had their fingers in that. And guess what? They were the only companies big enough to get the contracts to unwind the bankruptcy. So they got paid, again, millions of dollars for uh, unwinding the company that they helped fraud its way into a global collapse. All of these people don't know it, but they're worried about the same thing, right? If your glasses went up a thousand percent, it's because one company, Luxottica Essilor, owns every eyeglass brand you've ever heard of, from uh, uh, Coach to Dolce & Gabbana to uh, Oliver Peoples. They also own every retailer, Sears Optical, Target Optical, uh, Sunglass Hut. Um, uh, they own Bausch & Lohm. They own, um, uh, what's the other big one? Lens Crafters. And they also make more than 50% of the lenses in the world. And they've raised prices 1,000% a, a year, uh, in a decade, rather. And, and if you're pissed off because, like, the wrestlers you grew up with, are on GoFundMe begging for pennies so they can die with dignity because Vince McMahon misclassified them as contractors and took away their health insurance and now they can't treat their work-related injuries. You're pissed off about monopoly. And we have the chance to build a broad-based movement now. This is, this is a turning point where people are turning around and going, the, the thing that joins up oil companies lying about themselves roasting the planet and insurance companies lying about whether the bonds that they floated were any good and uh, all of these other firms that have gotten away with both literal and figurative murder for decades is monopoly and once we realize that once we realize that my owls and your ozone layer are really part of the same picture then we can build an unstoppable social movement and I think that is a beautiful and important place to end. I want to thank all of you, each of you, for your participation today. I'm really looking forward to seeing the other talks. Um, I've learned a lot. I know uh, everyone watching has too. Thank you.